Hi, I'm Richard Brown, and I'm a philosopher. <laughs> or at least I'm a guy with a PhD in philosophy. And uh, I've been doing a series of reactions uh, videos where I react to some classic philosophy videos that I have been meaning to check out. And I was doing this in the summer and then updated my computer. Um, what is going on with this shit? Okay, so I updated my computer and uh, I couldn't figure out how to fuck to do it anymore. So now I'm back. Colonel Quest. Oh, motherfucker, dude. Allergies. How do you have allergies in the winter? Ah! Punch my own fucking nose off. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so anyway, I was saying way back when. Yeah, so um, uh, I got a recommendation to check out uh, this uh, video of David Lewis. Someone said, react to that. And I said, all right. But then I had all that issue. So I I'm going to do it now. Why not? I meant to do it then. I'm going to do it now. So I have it pulled up over here. Let's see, how do I do this? Well, bam! <laughs> oh, dude, I fucking suck. Okay. <laughs> David Lewis. Yo, what's up, homie? Uh, world famous, world famous philosopher. Very influential. Um, I think uh, that this is, is uh, what experience teaches is giving a talk on that. So let's go ahead and listen in. We're particularly pleased to have Professor Lewis here, not only because he's a, a most eminent philosopher and one for whom we have the utmost respect, um, but because he's one that we can talk to and we learn a lot from him in the process. Yeah, he's very approachable. I hope that uh, you'll share this experience this evening. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Lewis. I'm not sure when he died. Um, hey Siri, when did David Lewis pass away? We'll see if Siri knows. Who David, David Lewis is. died October 14th, 2001 at age 60 in Princeton. Wow. 2001. That's it. Oh, I did not know that. Um, 2001. Okay, so I was still in California in 2001. Uh, see, now I, I remember. Did, no one cares about this, but I remember when I first came to New York and I was at the Graduate Center. I remember taking a class with Kripke. That was 2003. And um, I remember Kripke saying that. He seemed very sad. He was saying all his friends were dying. And so David Lewis died in 2001. Quine had just died in 2000. So in the la in that few years, must have been some other people passed away too. So well, I didn't realize that he died in 2001. Um, so I would have been... Uh, I graduated from my undergraduate in 2000. I was starting my first year of graduate school. Did I know who David Lewis was back then? I, I think I didn't. I would find out soon, but I didn't realize that. He, so, okay. Interesting. All right. I didn't know that. So I wonder when this was recorded too, by the way. Does it say? Presented in 1981, knowing what it's like. Um, this lecture was the basis for his paper, What Experience Teaches. Oh, it says it in the description. Okay, cool. This is from 81. <clears throat> All right, guys, in 81, I would have been nine years old. <laughs> cool. I hear the rustling of paper, folks. <laughs> Someone's shuffling some fucking paper. <laughs> What? He's going to read from it, isn't he? <clears throat> they say that experience is the best teacher and that the dusty classroom is no substitute for real life. This could mean all sorts of things, many of them false and many of them true. I mean, yeah, that's true. I'll just say as an aside, I remember uh, <clears throat> when I was in high school, I was the kind of kid that would sit in the back and just read the entire class like I had just read. Not the coursework, neither. I just like reading science fiction a lot. Um, and my English teacher, of all fucking people, dude, <laughs> told me was, so one of these days, you're going to have to pull your nose out of those books and live 
your life. <laughs> and I was like, the fuck I will. No, I'm, I didn't say that. But uh, um, I guess I did, right? I got arrested and went to juvenile halls. I live in my life. I don't know. I read a lot in there too. <laughs> I still, still read a lot. <laughs> Oh, experience. We already know where this is going. This is its famous ability hypothesis, just in case you don't know where this is going. I already sort of know. I didn't know that this this talk, but I already know the general theme of what experience teaches the paper, which is that in response to the knowledge argument, Lewis's idea is that what you learn is a new ability. You learn how to do something. You don't learn new facts. So I guess he's going to defend that here. Let's But let's continue. But there's one thing in particular along these lines that I think is true and important and potentially a threat to philosophical positions I'd like to hold. One thing it's a potential threat to is materialism or physicalism, yeah. this being the doctrine that physics, if not today's physics, some sort of theory along more or less the same lines, can reasonably be expected to give a complete and comprehensive description of the world, including the mental part of the world. Yeah, so uh, a lot of times you, it's very hard to say what counts as physical, and the more you kind of look into people's attempts at it, it's very slippery uh, notion to nail down um, without getting counterexamples or whatever. So the, the basic idea of physicalism, though, is just as Lewis is saying here, it's the idea that the physics of a, um, a physics of the kind that we have uh, or an extension of it along the lines without adding anything mental um, is going to account for everything else. And uh, so, you know, what kind of extensions? Well, some of them can be pretty radical because remember the, the switch that occurred between um, thinking in terms of, uh, you know, point particles and field theories. So when fields were first introduced, people thought they were very unphysical. Um, what are these things that you're talking about? <clears throat> Have a value at every point in space, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but now they're the paradigm of what we think of the physical is. So there, did we extend the Newtonian physics by introducing fields? Um, or did, did we add something fundamental to it? That, that's a question that's... Uh, so did we, did we add something fundamental that is new, the field? Or did we extend the kind of physics that we already had? Um, <clears throat> well, in one sense, the sense that matters for physicalism we extended the kind of physics we already had because the sort of thing that we started talking about was itself uh, math mathematically describable, obeyed certain laws, agreed with predictions and all those sorts of things. So in that sense, it was more of the same. Now it was a bit of a different thing, the field versus the point particle, um, but uh, uh, it wasn't an addition of something fundamentally mental and really, that's the way I think um, we should think in terms of physicalism is that physicalism is the idea that we don't need to introduce anything distinctively mental, something consciousness-like or mental-like to account for the nature of reality. All right, let's continue, though. The other threatened view, which is independent of materialism, is the view that there's no sort of contingent fact about the world which is in principle inaccessible to scientific investigation. By which I mean investigation that proceeds by observing effects and hypothesizing about their causes. Yeah, okay, so these are two different theses, right? So one is physicalism, the idea that we were just discussing. The other is this idea that um, that science can answer all these questions uh, so that there's nothing that's outside of the realm of this kind of science as we understand it. And you can kind of see where he's going here. 
uh, many people, including current people on the current scene, think that consciousness is somehow fundamentally different in the sense that it can't be studied in the same way um, as other phenomena because of its first person nature. And you, because of that, something important follows, they think. So Lewis wants that he says these are separate because physicalism could be true and we could still have this first person specialness that science can't get at. I, I, I have some sympathy to that view. Um, or you could have this, you know, first, so the, either one, but uh, he wants to defend both. And testing these hypotheses by seeing what further effects they predict and whether those effects show up. I think there's a version of the notion that experience is the best teacher, which is a threat to these views. So I want to defend them against it. So the version that would be a threat would be that there's only one way to know and that you learn a new fact. You learn it on the basis, uh, so science can't get at it and describe it. And what you learn is a is a is some propositional thing like seeing red is like this and that can be true or false. Um, he thinks that's the thing which is going to be uh, bothersome for physicalism. Yes, yeah, even I don't even think that is bothersome for physicalism, but that's a different story. Let's get back to this. Not by rejecting the premise. Wait, what? Which, not by rejecting the premise, which I don't think is a, an honest live option, for me anyway, but by looking for a way to interpret the premise so that it isn't any threat. Yeah, we know where this is going. So the conclusion of the Mary argument is that you learn something new, namely what it's like to see red. So you see red for the first time, and you go, holy shit, that's what it's like to see red? Um, so he doesn't want to deny that. Lewis's strategy is to agree that you learn something. You learn something new, but to interpret that in a way that's not threatening by saying what you learn is not a new fact but uh, a new ability. Um, it's like learning how to ride a bike or something. You learn that you acquire an ability to identify red things in a new way. I think that's the gist of it, right? Very popular thesis. Right. In the United States, we have- Wait, what is going interpret on Interpret the premise so that it isn't any threat. Right. 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 <laughs> In the United States, we have an animal called a skunk, which I believe doesn't exist here in Australia. Huh. The skunk defends <laughs> itself by chemical warfare. Uh, when it feels attacked, it sprays a foul-smelling liquid, which is rather persistent. Thus, patches of the st scent stay around for quite a while afterwards. The skunk often feels attacked by cars on country roads. Therefore, drivers on country roads often have the opportunity to smell the lingering scent of the skunk. It does stink, but if you're used to certain smells, it almost smells similar. <laughs> I've smelled this scent quite often, okay. and therefore I know what it is like mm. to smell a skunk. Uh, since uh, most of you have most... When he t when it, that's funny he's using this example because he's saying <clears throat> he's in Australia. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's in Australia. He thinks they most of them would not have smelled a smunk. Smelled a smunk? <laughs> smelled a skunk. Uh, and so he's trying to use an example of, of an experience they haven't had. I think when the paper comes out, doesn't he use Vegemite? which is a thing that they have in Australia, but most Americans wouldn't have had. I think that's the, he switches the example because of who the audience is going to be. So that's funny. But basically the idea is he's trying to, trying to prime us by getting us to think about an experience we've never had before. For me, I always talk about my experience with pineapple because when I first tasted pineapple, I was like, mm, this shit is delicious. I ate so much pineapple. My mouth was like infested with canker sores, raw diseased, not diseased, but you know, like the acidic acid um, ate through the, my cheek and it hurt. 
but I, I wanted more pineapple. So I remember like what it was like before I had pineapple and then I ate the pineapple. And now I know what it's like to eat pineapple and never go back. So he's trying to get us to think about these. What was that? I guess my email. <laughs> Don't fucking email me. I'm doing philosophy. <laughs> sort of. Um, so, uh, yes, he's trying to get us to think about these contrast cases where uh before you've had an experience you don't know what it's like people can kind of get you to think about what the taste of pineapple is or smell like a skunk or whatever and then after you've had the experience you do know what it's like so that's the thing that he doesn't want to deny that you learn what it's like i think that's what he's saying here right is that where he's going my job oh, skunk uh since uh most of you have mostly lived in a country where there aren't any skunks I think probably most of you haven't had that this experience. And therefore, I think that most of you don't know what it's like to smell a skunk. You don't know what it's like. <laughs> Look at Nagel, dude. And you never will, unless someday <laughs> you go where the skunks are and you smell a skunk for yourself. Go where the skunks are. <laughs> what? Did... Conversely, uh, in this country, there's a substance called Vegemite. Ah, and is. probably most of you <laughs> have tasted Vegemite. And you know what it's like to taste Vegemite. I haven't tasted. I don't. I've never had Vegemite. They did, and I don't know what it's like. Okay. And yeah. I, unless someday I taste some Vegemite, I never will know what it's like. Now, it won't help you at all. So this is something that I agree with. Um, that you need an ex the experience to acquire that knowledge. I I agree with that. There are some people who disagree with that. Like I know there are philosophers who think that you could in principle come to know what it's like um, <clears throat> without having the experience. So I don't want to, I'm sort of like Lewis in a sense. I mean, I'm a dumber <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> the sense in which I'm like him is that I don't, I don't want to deny that you learn something. I think you do. Um, I think maybe you could even learn something propositional though. So I don't even know if I have to deny that. But anyway, um, uh, I want to agree with him on that. You do learn something new. You know what you learn, what it's like to see red or to taste Vegemite or whatever it is, pineapple. And that it's just something that you couldn't have known without having the experience. Now people will press on that. And it's interesting that Lewis, I wonder if he's going to mention Hume's missing shade of blue in this because immediately people, I think, should try to, Think of Dave, David Hume's missing shade of blue. If you don't know that example, so in the treatise on human nature, Hume has this consider a case where you line up all the shades of blue, starting from the darkest to the lightest or whatever in a row, except for one in the middle. And you've seen them all except for that one. And he asks, could you like know by reason what it would look like? And he sort of says, yeah. And you could see why maybe, because uh, <clears throat> maybe it's not know by reason, but know without the experience, without seeing it. Because if, it, if there really was this continuum with just one missing, um, and then you could see the one over here and the one over here and all the variations, you could kind of like picture, you might think, what it would look like, what it, what it would be like to see that color without ever seeing it. Um, and Hume says, oh, that's not a problem for empiricism. It kind of goes on, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Does that suggest that you can know what it's like to see that color blue without experiencing it? I don't know. And then there's other cases like, you know, Dennett is Robo Mary, and there's all sorts of people who have tried to uh, to get at this. And I think even Pete Mandic has that uh, Swamp Mary. You guys know about Swamp Mary? Um, <laughs> uh, so um, a swamp creature is, you know, uh, lightning strikes a swamp and a creature is formed and it's a molecule for molecule duplicate of whoever you like. So in this case, it's a duplicate of you. And it springs into existence and sees red and then it is immediately anesthetized and falls asleep or something like that. I forget how the details go. Um, but then, uh, so Pete has the intuition that Swamp Mary knows what it's like to see red. Um, uh, when she's, wait, no, that's not how it goes. No, no, no. 
All right, fucked up Swamp Mary. So there's regular, ah, that's how, I just had a memory. There's regular Mary, she's in her room, she gets out, she sees red, she says, aha, that's what it's like to see red. Then you anesthetize her, she falls asleep. <laughs> then lightning strikes the bog. <laughs> Swamp Mary is brought into existence, a duplicate of the sleeping anesthetized Mary. Aha. So now we have Swamp Mary who's anesthetized and she's a duplicate of the original Mary who was anesthetized after she saw red. Post-released Mary, I guess is what the lingo is. And Mandic's claim is that um, <clears throat> Swamp Mary in this condition knows what it's like to see red because she's a duplicate of Mary who knows what it's like to see red. I'm not sure that's the right way to think about, I, I, I remember having a debate about this, but anyway, so that's way too much time on Swamp Mary. The point though is that, so people have tried to debate this claim that you don't need to have the experience to, to know what it's like, but I think you do. And it's, I think Lewis agreed, Lewis and I agree on this. So anyway, so I'll shut up, let's go back. What it's <laughs> like. Now, now, it won't help you at all in knowing what it's like to smell a skunk. And it won't help me at all in knowing what it's like to taste Vegemite if we take a course of lessons on the chemical composition of skunk scent or the chemical composition of Vegemite and on the physiology of the nostrils or of the taste buds and on the neurophysiology of the sensory nerves and the brain. None of that will do anything at all toward helping either of us know what it's like to have these experiences. So there, I think that um, in, in my way of thinking about this stuff, I think that you need to make a distinction <clears throat> between um, whether you have the phenomenal concept or not. So when Mary's in the room and has never had a color experience, uh, she doesn't have the phenomenal concepts. So if she didn't have the concept of water, she couldn't know that water was H2O. She has to have that concept first. She has to acquire it. So once she has the concept of water, someone can relay it to her, um, then uh, she could deduce that water is H2O given the situation. So if she had the concept, the phenomenal concept of red, then I think, yeah, in the why couldn't she make that deduction? Um, but uh, how would you get the phenomenal concept? Well, you have to have the experience. So you have to have the experience to acquire the concept that would allow you to know what it's like. So I think that when people like Philip Goff, who currently propounds this argument, he's a big fan of the knowledge argument and thinks that, um, uh, that this is a, you know, the way to really, the best way to present the case against physicalism starts, in his opinion, with this, at least in a popular way, uh, with a presentation of this. Um, but I just think that, you know, of course Mary's not going to be able to know what it's like to see red. Uh, she doesn't have the right concept. And so people have, have pushed back and said, look, so having the theory doesn't let you have the experience. And, and Goff says, I know. The theory is supposed to let you know what the experience is like, not that it gives you the experience. But to know what it's like requires having the phenomenal concept and it requires knowing the experiences like that and you have the concept. So if you need the, the experience to acquire the concept, um, then I think, uh, which I think a lot of people would agree with, right? And that's what, anyway, so I'm talking way too much about my view of the knowledge argument. Let's go back to David Lewis. Helping either of us know what it's like to have these experiences we haven't had. Further example, due to Frank Jackson, I'll call it the example of the captive scientist. A brilliant scientist has lived from birth... Oh, so here's the Mary, okay. In a I forget it's 81 when they're talking. ...a prison cell where everything is black or white, or maybe shades of gray. Maybe the scientist herself is covered in a white coverall, or maybe they come in the night with paint. Anyway, <laughs> no exception. She looks at the world on television. For instance, but it's black and white television. For instance, 
She watches the result of many scientific experiments conducted under her direction. She sends her assistants wherever she wants them to go and tells them what experiments and observations they are to perform. She reads books and journals on television, or perhaps they make black and white copies and give them to her. Uh, using two-way television and telephones, she joins in scientific discussion, as it were, attends scientific conferences and Zoom, <laughs> this is 81. <laughs> forth. In this way, she becomes the world's leading expert on color and on color vision and on the brain states that are produced by colors. Right. She knows exactly what reflection spectra or wavelengths of light produce what effects on the eye, which in turn produce what effects on the brain, which in turn produce what effects in verbal and other behavior. And she knows a great deal, far more than anyone here is likely to know about which things emit light of which wavelengths. And she has the, she has a sideline in theoretical semantics, knows just what prop, and putting together the physics and the semantics, she knows just what properties of things are denoted by the color words and by the color experience words and what general linguistic rules and conventions there are in virtue of which those words denote. Wow, she did, wow, all that stuff. Okay, so she knows the correct theory of reference, semantics, conventions. <laughs> I mean, you have to, it's true, because the word red, what does it pick out? Well, it picks out some property in the world. Well, what? So he's saying she knows that it's like, you know, spec reflectance properties or what. So she knows all of the completed details of the science. Um, but could she know on the basis of that what it's like to see red uh, without having the experience of it? Well, no, that's how she, she would bring into existence the concept. Um, you need the concept. Uh, okay, I'm not going back down there. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things. I don't say she understands the words. That's another and a harder question. I don't think we'll need to settle that question. Okay. Right. But for all I mean, the issue there, because if you don't, if you never had the color experience, do you really understand the word red? Um, you could do, you could debate that. Does so she really know what red means in that sense? Yeah, she, she knows uh, <clears throat> that ever picks out these things, these properties, uh, uh, this brain states, that physical property in the world. But does she really know what it means? Well, not if it's attached to the experience. So I think that... Uh, this is kind of getting at the kind of concept issue. <laughs> and he's kind of sidestepping it right there. So it seems like the kind of issue that I want to harp on, um, he's, he's set, he's like kind of acknowledging, but setting aside. That question. Right. Wait, what does he say about it exactly? Conventions there are in virtue of which those words denote <laughs> those things. I don't say she understands the words. That's another and a harder question. I don't think we'll need to settle that question. Right. But for all that, she doesn't know what it's like to see color. And she isn't going to know what it's like to see color unless she gets out of her cell, where the colored things are, and has the experience of seeing color. Final case, the bat, perhaps the most famous instance of the problems I'll be discussing, though I think not the uh, first or the most clearly presented. Nagel rather runs a number of separate issues together. Oh, poor Nagel. I don't think that's, ex well, I guess that is fair, yeah. Um. <laughs> okay, anyway, poor Nagel. <laughs> uh, if you want a really clear account of the matter, I would like to refer you to the paper by Frank Jackson, which I put on the board, but uh, until it's published, I'm not sure I can. Well, if you're interested in reading further, watch out for that paper. He must be talking about um, epiphenomenal qualia. Was that the where is that the paper? I wonder what paper's on the board. Anyhow, the case of the bat. Anyhow, the bat is an alien creature. I don't mean from another planet, but for a creature of this planet, it's pretty alien, with a sonar sense, which is quite unlike any sense that we have. We can never have the experience of a bat, 
for we couldn't become bat-like enough to have those experiences without ceasing to be ourselves. Uh, th this is kind of a tangent, but this is something that I always wonder about because, yeah, well, how do we know we couldn't have the experience of a bat? Because, for example, now it's true, they echolocate, so they're screeching, eek, eek, this coming, the sounds are coming back, entering their ear, there's a part of their brain which is processing that information, whatever. So I assume they're having some sort of experience. But how do we know it's not visual experience, right? Maybe they are seeing what we would call seeing using echolocation. Maybe they are hearing um, the location in that sense. So I, now you're right, we can't ever have the experience of a bat to verify that or not. But um, it seems to me to assume it's a kind of alien experience that's not like hearing or vision is already to assume we know something about it, which, um, you know, doesn't seem... Yeah, it doesn't seem like we're, we should be able to do that. But anyway, that's a tangent, because yeah, I know what he means, so let's continue. And even if I could turn you into a bat, all we'd have then would be a bat having bat experiences. We wouldn't have a human who has done this difficult thing and found out what it's like to be a bat, because you wouldn't be human anymore. We'll never know, therefore, what it is like to be a bat. I mean, that is an interesting point, because turn you into a bat, what would that even mean? I have to give you a bat brain? Well, all the things that make you human would have to be gone then. So you would just be a bat. That wouldn't be a you. It would just be there was a bat there. And then I turned you back into a human by adding all that stuff. Could you not remember the bat experience? He seems to assume you could not. Or if you did, it would be filtered through your human experience. Um, it doesn't matter. We can't do it anyway. But uh, yeah, so I, I agree. I sort of agree that we can't ever know what it's like to be a bat. Uh, all right, so these are all things which allegedly, I, I don't know, a lot of people take Nagel's argument to be an attack on physicalism. I don't. I take it to be um, a kind of reflection on how we have these kind of, we're pulled in, in two different directions. I take it to be a reflection on how we're pulled in two different directions. A reflection, um, a reflecting upon this idea that on the one hand, we have very strong evidence for physicalism, but on the other hand, we can't understand how it could be true. Uh, okay, anyway, but back to the story here. Not even if we come to know all the facts there are about the behavior of bats and the behavioral disposition of bats. Notice on the way I think of things, I would agree with that because we could have never acquire those phenomenal concepts. So if, even if we had the uh, the full physiology of the bat, without having the bat experience, we, we wouldn't have the appropriate concepts that would allow us to make any kinds of inferences about what we were looking at. We wouldn't have the right theory of bat psychology, in other words, um, to make sense of all the wiring that we're being confronted with. So that doesn't mean physicalism is false. It just once again means that you need... In order to know these things, you need the experience. Um, Not only what bats do, but also what they would have done if put into all sorts of alternative circumstances that they never were put into. Wait, and what did I just miss? Disposition of bats. Not only what bats do, but Wait, hold on. therefore what it is like to be a bat. Not even if we come to know all the facts there are about the behavior of bats. Right. and the behavioral disposition of bats. Not only what bats do, but also what they would have done if put into all sorts of alternative circumstances that they never were put into. And not even if we come to know all the facts there are about the bat's physical structure and the physical processes that go on in a bat. I don't mean just the gross anatomy, but the cell-by-cell -cell anatomy, and eventually the molecule-by-molecule -molecule and the quark-by-quark -quark anatomy. And not even if we come to know all the same sorts of physical facts about other bats, or about other creatures, or about ourselves. And not even if we come to know all physical facts whatsoever. The complete physical description, electron by electron and quark by quark, of our... Yeah, so, I mean, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, okay, 
So even if science was complete, if we do every fact about physical reality that there were, could we not know what it's like to be a bat? And we are ideal reasoners with a complete, fully, full picture of reality. Maybe we would just know what it's like to be a bat. Um, kind of losing my grip on why we're supposed to be, even if, no. We wouldn't have the bat experience. Can you know what it's like to, without having the experience? What a strange thing to even ask for when you really think about it. It's very strange. What it's like is experience. <laughs> so can you know about experience without experience? Um, yeah. I don't know. I was thinking yes, but now I'm thinking no, no, no. I was thinking no, that you need experience to get the concepts. But now I'm wondering why I think that. Did you just come to know that the bat was seeing something as opposed to hearing something or hearing as opposed to seeing or that it was like neither of those or that? Yeah. Anyway, well, let's 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 think about it. Let's continue. World over the whole of space and the whole of time together with all the probabilities, all the laws, all the causal relations, all the hypothetical facts about how things would have been if they had been somehow different. And not even if we became able instantly to recognize each and every mathematical or logical consequence of the facts we know, no matter how complicated. That would be a course of lessons indeed but it wouldn't be enough to enable someone who isn't a bat and can't have the experiences of the bat to know what it's like to be a bat. So experience is the best teacher in the following sense. Yeah, by the way, I feel like people's intuitions about this really start to fade away when you get into emotional states and pain. So when you talk about like, does the bat feel pain if you stab it through the neck? Do bats have necks through the wing, whatever. So you stab the bat, and it starts screeching and flapping around, does it experience something that we would recognize as pain? Well, according to Lewis here, the answer is no, we can't know, right? We have no idea what the bats, what it's like to be the bat. We can't know it, even with the completed physics, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, most, I tend to think, yeah, the pain, pain is pain. There's a unit of pain, a pain experience for me. There's a sense in which you could get the same amount of pain in the bat as I had, um, from a stab. Now there's a bunch of other stuff that I would have too, but uh, the pain, so, but if you really take, so this is something that I've had to deal with because when, like when I work with Joe Ledoux and we work on fear and stuff, Ledoux says, well, the rats don't feel fear because fear is a word that just, that we apply to a human emotion. Um, whatever the rat feels, they don't have language, so they can't label it as fear or terror or whatever. So their experience is completely different. And, and people get all upset and say, they don't feel fair, blah, blah. But in a way, it's just the Nagel point. The Nagel point and the point that Lewis is making is that we can't ever know what it's like to be the bat. Well, can we know what it's like to be the rat? No, can't know what it's like to be a bat. What about a cat? <laughs> what do you think about that? But now Nagel was like, well, there's points of view and the more similar they are, the more we can kind of map on, like use our kind of empathetic imagination or some shit to map onto their point of view. Um, so I can kind of know what it's like to be you in a sense, uh, Nagel thought, um, but uh, I couldn't really know what it's like to be a bat. Could I know what it's like to be a rat? Well, I don't know. Um, so Ledoux thinks no, uh, I think it's complicated. But anyway, so let's continue. I don't know how, what the fuck, okay. Whatever other senses it may or may not be true in. Having an experience is the best way, very nearly it's the only way, of coming to know what that experience is like. Very nearly. Hedge. Qualifications. 
you can come to know what an experience is like by having very similar experiences and then extrapolating or interpreting. Oh, here's the human. But that's coming to know what one experience is like by coming to know what another experience is like. All right, so that's the way he's going to deal with the Hume stuff, right? So, because you already know what blue is like, so now you just know you're comparing. I think that's the way he's going to deal with that, maybe? Is that what this is for? Like, uh, taking it into account won't change anything, and I'm not going to fuss about it. Okay. Second qualification, maybe you would know what an experience is like if by magic or by surgery, the very same changes were produced in your brain that would have been produced by the experience if you'd had it. Yeah. Maybe that would be a way of coming to know what an experience is like without having the experience. By magic or surgery. So is this, oh, is he anticipating Swamp Mary already? <laughs> is, he, is this a Swamp Mary anticipation? Uh, yeah, fucking Swamp Mary up in this shit. Um... Yeah, so by magic or surgery, you produce the same state, then you can know what it's like. But that's not a threat to physicalism. Well, I mean, the Swan Mary wasn't a threat to physicalism. It was supposed to be a threat to this whole idea that you only can know what it's like on the basis of experience, um, <clears throat> which is a premise of the knowledge argument. But uh, anyway, okay, so maybe he's going to use this. He would. If he were around and read Pete's paper, maybe he would use this as a way to get back at him. I wonder what Pete says about this. Anywho. All the same, it's close to true that the only way to know what an experience is like is to have the experience. Okay, so close to true. That Those are the uh, qualifications. So maybe in this, so maybe he would agree with Pete that Swamp Mary knows what it's like to see red. But that's not really a threat to the main thesis because it's a weird, such a weird case. Sounds like that's what he's saying. Cool. And certainly, lessons won't do it. No amount of scientific information about the stimuli that produced the experience, no amount of information about the process that goes on in you when you have that experience, no amount of scientific information of any other kind you please will enable you to know what it's like. I don't know. So... How could you do this in a way that's not cheating? Because I think you need the concepts to do this. So, you know, there's this other version of the room where Mary, like, comes into a kaleidoscope room. Is this the Needle Ruman version or something? I forget who is that. I had to look it up. The Technicolor room. Um, so could she, like, she sees the red and then she goes into the room and could she figure out which one is red? Is that how that works? She'd have to somehow acquire the concept. Um, a phenomenal red. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, okay, so let's go back. Now, I think some, some materialist, naming no names, might try to resist this conclusion as follows. Okay. A materialist might say, Knowing what it's like when so-and-so happens means knowing what experiences one has when so-and-so happens. For instance, knowing what it's like to uh, drive a steam locomotive on an express train means knowing what experiences a locomotive driver has. Physical information does so answer the question. The bat's experience of detecting a bug by sonar is the state that occupies such and such a role in the bat's functional organization. Okay. I mean by that, that if we tried to characterize the states of the bat in an abstract way, as we might try to characterize the uh, states of a computer, if we had software knowledge but not hardware knowledge, by saying which combinations of states and inputs cause which combinations of states and outputs, then if we knew enough about the bat, we could characterize the bat's experience of detecting a bug by sonar by its place in that causal network. And yeah, so that's functionalism, analytic functionalism or something like that. <clears throat> maybe you can even extend that to IIT, the integrated information theory is a distant cousin of that maybe. Um, okay, physical information does answer that question. What state is the bat in and these connections, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't tell you what it's like, he's going to say, right? Besides, if we had enough physical information, we could also answer the question on a hardware level. We could find out exactly which state it is 
that turns out to be the one that occupies such and such a role in the bat's functional organization. Right. It turns out to mm. be the one consisting of so-and-so pattern of firing of the bat's neurons. Right. That's what the bat's experience is. We can refer to the bat's experience both in an abstract way in terms of functional role and in a more detailed way in terms of its physical realization. Yeah, we can refer to the experience. I think he slipped that in there. That's correct, obviously. We refer to it in this way, because that is the experience, <clears throat> if you're a physicalist, right? Right. Having that right. experience is what it's like to be a bat. I've told you what experience uh, the bat has, and now you know what it's like to be a bat. Right, so that's a bit, so you see what's going on here, the person saying, We've identified the state when the bat has the experience it goes into that state that's the that's the state now you know it so you know what it's like it's like having that state but of course that's not the same as you having the state which is going to be his objection well I that's think. wrong uh, wait what do you say what it's like to be a bat well that's wrong yeah <laughs> uh, i accept the materialist's premise that experiences are definable by functional role in physical realization that's a long story. I'm not going to uh, tell it properly here. But I don't accept the conclusion that we know what it's like to be a bat when we know enough about the bat's functional organization and the states that occupy the roles. Right. I do accept the conclusion that physical information tells us what experience the bat has. Yes. But it wasn't right to say at the start Knowing what it's like when so-and-so means knowing what experience one has when so-and-so. That's not enough. To know what it's like when so-and-so, we must not only know what experiences one has when so-and-so, but also we must know what it's like to have those experiences. Right, I can tell you what it's like to be an engine driver if I can tell you what experiences the engine driver has. Provided you know what it's like to have those experiences. Right, you got to know what is, that's the whole point. <laughs> you don't just say, um, so what would be a good like analogy for this? It'd be like, uh, <laughs> suppose that you, you had never uh, tasted pineapple before. And I said, oh, you want to know what it's like to taste pineapple? I mean, this happened to me at the table the other day in a version. My son, who's six years old, was, uh, he didn't want to eat, we were eating sofritos and he, and he didn't want to eat them. He was like, but what do they taste like? <laughs> I was like, dude, you have to eat them to know that. And um, so, okay, suppose that um, you, uh, you said, oh, you want to know what it's like to taste those? Well, here's the chemical composition of the beans. Your brain goes into this state when your tongue meets the beans, etc. cetera. Um, so what it's like to taste them is like this. And you show them the brain state. Well, that doesn't answer the question. He wants to know what having that state is like. <laughs> That's the point, right? And probably you do. And if I know enough, and if materialism is true and I know enough bat physics, I can tell you what experience the bat has. Yeah. But this time you won't know what it's like to be a bat because you won't know what it's like to have those experiences. Okay. So though I too am a materialist, I don't think this materialist way of turning aside the problem is any good. The, who, did, who, who took this way of doing right. it? I don't Part know. Two. There is a natural and tempting explanation of why it is that physical information about an experience doesn't help us to know what the experience is like. Yeah. This explanation is the hypothesis that as well as physical information, there is an irreducibly different kind of information to be had. Call it phenomenal information. Ooh. The two Sounds kinds of information scary. are independent. Two possible cases might be exactly alike physically, yet they might differ phenomenally. Physical information won't separate the cases. Phenomenal information will. When we get physical information, we narrow down the physical possibilities. And maybe we narrow them down all the way to one if we have the sort of utopian physical information that I imagined us having about the bat. But we leave open a range of phenomenal possibilities. When we have an experience, we acquire phenomenal information. Possibilities previously open are eliminated, and that is what it is to learn what the experience is like. That is what I call the phenomenal information hypothesis. That is the thesis 
that I don't like and want to dispose of. Right, that's dualism, that's uh, panpsychism, epiphenomenalism, property dualism, all of those views that say, I wonder if, if non-reductive physicalism, I, I mean, yeah, I, maybe I'll talk about non-reductive physicalism at a different time. Uh, now there's Jonathan Schaefer's grounding physicalism. I don't know, physicalism, yeah, so let's, let's not get distracted, focus. <laughs> I can't refute it. But I shall argue first that it is a stranger. So he can't refute the non-physicalist view. That's what he's saying. But a stranger? I can't refute it. But I shall argue first that it is a stranger idea and a less tempting one than it may at first seem. Because of epiphenomenal. And then second, I shall argue that we are not forced to accept it since there is an alternative hypothesis available. Ability. The sense in which experience is the best and almost the only teacher when it comes to knowing what an experience is like, doesn't have to be captured by the hypothesis of phenomenal information. I will suggest that it can instead be captured by an alternative hypothesis, which as you see, will turn out to be called the ability hypothesis. I mean, I wonder if he's gonna address the most common objection, which is that it just seems wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that there's no new fact um, that uh, that's the same fact that she learns in a new way, but she doesn't learn like, oh, that's what it's like to see red. That it's, that there's no true sentence of the form, a true proposition um, associated with that. That it's just a like learning how to ride a bike. Uh, yeah, I wonder if he's going to say anything about that. Well, huh? Now, what's strange about the hypothesis of phenomenal information? What is strange about Three it? Three points. Okay. First, some of you may have thought all along that physical information was inadequate to explain the phenomena of mind. You may have been convinced all along that the mind can do things that no physical system ever can do. Yeah. That it can bend spoons or it can invent new jokes or it can prove the consistency of arithmetic, or it can reduce the wave packet, or whatever. You may have been convinced that the full causal story of how the deeds of mind are accomplished must be a story that involves the causal interaction not only of material bodies, but also of astral bodies. Not only the vibrations of the electromagnetic field, but also the good or bad vibes of the psionic field. Not only protoplasm, but ectoplasm. I doubt this. I think as a bet on the adequacy of scientific theories, the thing to do is to bet on a winner to go on winning. But maybe you think that in dealing with certain phenomena, perhaps some of those I listed or perhaps some other ones, the former winner has already lost beyond hope of recovery. Well, never mind. This question, this question about what an adequate, complete scientific theory should look like, is irrelevant to our topic. And there is no joy for you in what I have said. <laughs> you and the physicalist are in the same boat. Suppose it's all true. Every such hypothesis that ever was proposed in all of California and more besides. <laughs> what? <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> As a Californian, I don't know. Am I? St I yeah. I left California in two thousand two. Am I still a Californian? Um, now that I'm skateboarding in the fucking thirty degree weather. <laughs> anyway, what talk a shit about California, dude? Woo. All right, but anyway, I get what he's saying. So he's saying. <clears throat> <clears throat> dualism of some shit, some non-physicalism, some weird, wacky shit. Let's suppose that shit, something like that, were true. Okay, then what? Let parapsychology be defined as the science of all the non-physical entities, all the causal yeah, processes. Exactly. Okay. I'm sorry, all the non-physical entities, all the non-physical causal processes, all the non-physical laws of nature and so forth that may be required to explain the things that we do. Okay. Not to mention all the causal processes and laws and so forth that govern the interaction between the physical and the non-physical part. Right. 
if the non-physical part is required to explain things we do, like tell novel jokes, of course, the non-physical part will be in part explaining occurrences in the physical part. Right. Out of the physical mouth come the physical noises. They constitute a novel joke. If it takes some sort of non-physical system ever to invent a new joke, then this non-physical system has to interact with the physical mouth. Okay, right, right, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting because, yeah, this is the sort of thing that Sean Carroll was saying. He was like, look, if someone could ever convince me that I couldn't do something, uh, that the zombie couldn't do something, sorry, sorry, that when you imagine the physical duplicate without consciousness, that it wasn't able to do something, well, then that would be a good reason to think that um, consciousness uh, was non-physical because um, it was important for doing something. It interacted with the physical world in a way that when it was got, when it was missing, um, the, the physical world was different. Now I did the video where we talked about that. So you can go back over there. But uh, so I wonder if what he's, if he's going for a epiphenomenalism thing here, I think, is that where this goes? I now forget what the, what the kill shot <laughs> in the paper is against the non-physical view. It's strange because of epiphenomenalism. Is that what's going on here? Okay, let's suppose that we learn ever so much parapsychology. Let's suppose it's all true, and we manage to formulate it precisely and confirm it experimentally. Okay. It makes no difference at all to what I've said. The captive scientist may study the parapsychology as well as the psychophysics of color vision, and she still won't know what it's like. Lessons on the aura of Vegemite will do no more for me than lessons <laughs> on its chemical composition. Okay, that's just <laughs> Lessons on the aura of Vegemite. <laughs> uh, I mean, it... <laughs> all right, I'm not going to recover from the aura of the... Vegemite. Um, <clears throat> Tha, uh, all right, so in a sense, you see what he's saying, I guess. Um, so, you know, suppose that you think there's a psychophysical law, a la David Chalmers, that connects functional organization of kind F to experience of kind R. Um, okay, so now you have a person who's studying a Mary who's studying the psychophysical laws in addition to the um, the regular physical laws. So, so she's never had the experience um, of red. She's never seen red, but she now is not only knowing all the physical facts, but now she comes to know the psychophysical laws that this is associated with the experience of red. That there's a non-physical fact called red. This that it's associated with this brain state and the non-physical fact called green and the non-physical red is more similar to green. So she comes to know that stuff, but uh, without without experiencing the color, she doesn't really know the laws because what they relate is the the phenomenal properties so conceived to the physical uh, functional states. <clears throat> so she, she it's true that yeah she would be missing. Um, the thing, because the, uh, she doesn't have the non-physical properties there, so that she's not acquainted with them. So I'm not sure how this is really a problem for them, because it doesn't show that non-physicalism is false. Uh, uh, oh, I see where he's going. Duh. You're going to say, well, so the same is true for physicalism. You just have to be acquainted with these things to know what it's like, right? If indeed it has an aura which is important to the way it tastes. Okay. And so it goes. Yeah. My point is that the intuitive datum we started with wasn't just that physics lessons couldn't help the inexperienced person to know what it's like. The starting point was that lessons couldn't help. Lessons can't help because they're just talk. They don't include getting the experience and short of irrelevant exceptions, that's the only way. If there is such a thing as phenomenal information, it isn't just independent of physical information. It's independent of any sort of information, whatever, that can be served up in lessons for the inexperienced. Yeah, okay. So, an argument for phenomenal information isn't just an argument for parapsychology. It's an argument for something much stranger. Yeah, yeah it's, an, it's an argument 
for acquaintance, right? Is, is that what he's trying to say? Well, that's the stranger thing, a way of directly knowing or something like that, because um, like there's inf so what they're claim so the traditional claim of the knowledge argument is that there are facts which aren't can't be captured by physical descriptions. So he's saying, yeah, but there are facts that can't be captured by any descriptions, including ones of the psychophysical law. So the psychophysical laws would involve no, not just descriptions, but the, yeah. So is that question begging? Is that, can't the physicalist say something? Is that where he's going with this? The issues are very tricky here. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, let's, let's see where this goes. That was my first reason for so, but disliking what's... the hypothesis of phenomenal information. Here's the second. When the captive scientist is released, her jaw drops. She says, at last I know what it's like. Wait, so that was the first reason for disliking phenomenal information, because if there is phenomenal properties that, um, I can email soon, if there are phenomenal properties that, uh, that Mary can't know about and that are <clears throat> not non-physical, then Mary can't know about them by description of the non-physical laws either. But why is that a reason for not liking the non-physical properties? It's just saying that in, um, I mean, is it true that if dualism, if non-physicalism were true, then you should become, you should be able to know on the basis of physics and the psychophysical laws? Um, I think when Chalmers talks about this and he talks about PTQI, P is the physical information, T is a that's all claim, right? Uh, and Q is the, the consciousness stuff and I is indexical stuff. From that base, he thinks you can know everything else. Um, but like, uh, you know, I am seeing red or to know, like to know, to have that in the base, the red phenomenal redness. Could Mary know what it's like to see red? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I. I I think, I don't know if this has been addressed, or maybe it has. Anyway, yeah, so let, let's hear what he has to say. Liking the okay. hypothesis of phenomenal information. Here's the second. Hmm. When the captive scientist is released, her jaw drops. She says, at last I know what it's like. By its shape, this stuff must be grass. So this is what it's like to see green. Afterwards, she can do things she couldn't before. For instance, she can say which one of a batch of color chips is the green one. One might have thought that she said what she did and acquired the ability that she did because she came to know what it's like to see green. Yes. One might have thought that. I do. But it isn't so if the hypothesis of phenomenal information is right. Uh -huh. For suppose the phenomenal facts had been otherwise, so that she acquired different phenomenal information. Or suppose that the phenomenal aspect of her experience had been missing altogether. Yeah, so, I mean... People do talk about invert Mary. Um, invert Mary sees what we would call green when she looks at the tomato and what we would see red when she looks at the grass. So this is part of Chalmers's actual argument against like phenomenal concepts or these kind of pure phenomenal concepts being um, <clears throat> indexical or something like that. Because when regular Mary looks at the tomato and says, oh, that's what it's like to see red. She has what we call a phenomenal red experience. When Invert Mary looks at the tomato and says, that's what it's like to see red, um, she has what we would call a green experience. So, uh, right, so they, they're indexical, they're pointing at different things, their phenomenal properties are different, so their phenomenal concepts are different, so that it can't just be a demonstrative, right? Um, that's kind of Chalmers's point, as I understand it. Uh, so, right, I mean, but what's the objection to that he's going for here? The phenomenal like, aspect oh, acquired different phenomenal information. Right. Or suppose that the phenomenal aspect of her experience had been missing 
all together. Right. So she's a zombie. She gets out and it's like missing. She said, that's what I'd like to see where there's nothing there. Okay. The phenomenal aspect being the aspect which is the alleged subject matter of phenomenal information, whatever that may be. Yeah. Would that have made the slightest difference to what she said or did then or later? Uh, so this is like the Sean Carroll objection. So, um, okay, interesting. I think not. For if the phenomenal aspect makes any difference to the noises out of the mouth, or if it makes any difference to the motions of the jaw, these being physical phenomena, then we can describe the phenomenal aspect partially by its physical effects. Right. So... And, but this is exactly the invert Mary case, right? She says, oh, that's what it's like to see red. So she says all the same stuff, but it's just that she's now having the phenomenal property of greenness, even though she's like identical to the regular Mary in all physical ways. Um, the non-dualist accepts that already. So I don't really see what the objection here is supposed to be. And I don't think it shows that consciousness doesn't have any role to play in what regular Mary says for reasons I went over in my other video. Um, uh, so I don't think epiphenomenalism is, is the result of this, although Jackson did formulate it in that way, and it originally was presented as an argument for epiphenomenal qualia, um, and Chalmers was sympathetic to epiphenomenalism, maybe still is, in his, uh, book, The Conscious Mind, he says it's a possibility that I am open to, or that's, you know, can, you know what, one of the options, um, but not the one, you know, that he's most sympathetic to maybe. But uh, anyway, so I I think he's doing the same thing here. I think that, yeah, the, the a phenomenal property could have made a difference. If it, it depends on how the theories go. You don't have to be an epiphenomenalist. Some people are. Others aren't. That will enable us to give lessons on it to the inexperienced. But whenever we can give lessons on it to the inexperienced, we, then it won't be the alleged unique subject matter of phenomenal information. Right, because so the way out of this is that there's different concepts. <laughs> there's the, the, this kind of concept I was talking about before is like the pure, direct, whatever, the one that gets right to the phenomenal property. Um, and then there's these other ones, the public concept and so both Mary and Inver Mary have the same public concept of red because in their environment, people call those things red and they use the words red in the correct way. So they have that concept, but they have different like um, uh, pure phenomenal concepts because one's phenomenal green and one's phenomenal red. So what's the, I don't really see what the objection here is. On it to the inexperienced. We, Wait, what is this point here? Hold on. By its physical effects. And that will enable us to give lessons on it to the inexperienced. Wait, hold on. Okay. For if the phenomenal aspect makes any difference to the noises out of the mouth, or if it makes any difference to the motions of the jaw, these being physical phenomena, then we can describe the phenomenal aspect partially by its physical effects. Right. And that will enable us to give lessons on it to the inexperienced. Yes. But whenever we can give lessons on it to the inexperienced, we, then it won't be the alleged unique subject matter of phenomenal information. True. Phenomenal information is something you can't get knowledge of by being given lessons and not having the experience. So, if the alleged phenomenal aspect plays any causal role in regard to the physical that would enable us to give lessons on it, then it isn't the phenomenal aspect after all. No. Um, then you just can't know what it's like on, from that basis. I don't really see... Maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, I don't see what the objection here is. Now, here things get a bit complicated. We might say there are coarse and fine distinctions in the phenomenal world. Yeah. Take all the possible ways the world may be. Divide them up by physical differences. 
chalkboard. Hmm, old school. So that all these cases are physically just alike, all these cases are physically just alike, and so forth, but any case in one cell differs physically from any case in any other. Okay. Right. Yeah. Now, my opponent thinks that there are some finer differences to be made, namely, in what they experience phenomenal like. differences. Right, exactly. That is, we can subdivide the physically similar cases into phenomenally different ones, so that by finding out which white cell you're in, you haven't yet found out which pink cell you're in. Okay. <clears throat> that now, is what they think, yeah. yeah, yeah. Suppose that my opponent thinks that some phenomenal differences influence the motions of the jaw and the vibrations of the air in front of the mouth, as they must if the phenomenal realm causes the remarks that seemingly occur after and because of a first exposure to something new in the phenomenal realm. Right. Well then, I could have described the phenomenal possibilities by saying in advance, by saying what physical effects they would cause, and I could have told the captive scientist in advance which phenomenal possibility was the right one, namely, it's the one that causes such and such effects. Correct. But maybe only the coarse <laughs> aspects of the phenomenal differences have physical effects, and the finer ones don't. Maybe there is a further subdivision. I'm not sure if they have physical effects, but I guess what his, his model of a physical effect is is the, like really a dualist model, um, like uh, interactive dualism. But as we talked about in that other video, you can make sense of interactive dualist, interactive dualism <clears throat> being true, even in these cases by conceiving of duplicate worlds where there's causal gaps or something. The waters are tricky here. Um, but I, but I, I sort of see where he's going with this is like, <clears throat> if you're really, it's very interesting because it's very similar to the line that Sean Carroll was pressing against um, uh, Goff and company, which was, um, look, the consciousness that we care about causes things in the world. My pain causes me to wince and run around. That's obvious, it seems. So if you're saying the, that the phenomenal property is over and above the physical and can vary independently of the physical, then it can't really have any effect. That's the line of argument. I think that's a very intuitive line of argument, but I just don't know if it really... I guess he's saying it can't refute it. But I don't really think it corners them into epiphenomenalism. I don't think that's the case. Or maybe I'm missing what he's saying here. I don't... Bah. I won't subdivide all along. Please do imagine further subdivisions all over the place. Yeah. So, on this compromise view, the, the uh, really ineffable part, the part that you can really come to know only by having the experience, is which of the green subdivisions you're in. Well, Let's well, just we can't turn. see the color coding, but he had white, pink, and now green. So the white was all the physically alike ones. And then in there, you could subdivide like, oh, physically alike, but uh, different experiences in pink. So the green ones must be just like in what your experience is like. You can know like which block you're in, but not like which white block you're in. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> the pink line's white. Wait, hold on. By having the experience is which of the green subdivisions you're in. Yeah. Well, let's just turn the pink lines white. Uh, if the part that can be, the part that isn't ineffable, the part that's uh, describable by its causal role in influencing the physical, isn't part of what I call phenomenal information, the problem arises all over again about the differences between possibilities that are marked by the green lines, and then I say all over again, these differences have nothing to do with the behavioral effects 
that you might have thought were caused by discovering which of the green cells you're in. It, they would have been just the same if it had been a different one. That is my second objection. Right, and as we've said, as much as I want to agree, that doesn't show that uh, the, the non-physical stuff does something here. You can imagine various ways, interactive dualism, quantum. He mentioned a couple, I don't know, by astral chain or whatever, but uh, um, yeah, I don't really buy this line of argument. I mean, I like physicalism more than most people, <laughs> but I don't really buy this line of argument. It just seems like you're really boxing in. But I also see it, it's so complicated because you're imagining, you're conceiving of a, a world that's physically just like ours, Everything is exactly the same, but consciousness is missing. And you're saying, ah, oh, well, there's just these unexplained events. Is that really conceivable? I, it starts to get slippery. So anyway, I feel the, I can see why people want to rally around this. I just feel like uh, we're letting, we're letting them get one over on us if we're backed into this corner. <laughs> 